before we jump in. Okay, very good. So here we go. First document, <clears throat> Declaration of Independence. You might know Declaration of Independence was written by Thomas Jefferson. Sometimes they like to ask questions. Who wrote the Constitution or who wrote the Declaration of Independence? So you should know Declaration of Independence was written by Thomas Jefferson. They also like to ask questions about the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment is that time period, late 1600s, 1700s, early 1800s, uh, based on rationalism, the idea that we can use our brains to figure out things about the world. And so Enlightenment ideas are a big part of the Declaration of Independence, specifically the Enlightenment ideas of John Locke, who wrote the two treatises of government. John Locke wrote about our natural rights. Natural rights are rights that you are born with just by nature of being human. And John Locke said that we have the right to life, liberty, and property. Thomas Jefferson stole that. He changed it slightly though. What did he say? Not life, liberty, and property. Yeah, pursuit of happiness. <clears throat> um, so a lot of the words of the Declaration of Independence come straight from John Locke. Okay, Declaration of Independence also exemplifies the concept of popular sovereignty. That is one of those words that you need to know for the test, or phrases, I guess. Popular, meaning from the population, the people. Sovereignty to be in control. So in our government, the people have the authority. The government gets its power from the people. This is popular sovereignty. And in the Declaration of Independence, it said that people created governments to secure their natural rights. Their rights come from the God, nature's God, however you want to say that. Uh, in the Declaration of Independence, it says nature's God. Um, so Declaration of Independence says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And of course, then it goes on to argue that if the people don't like the government anymore, they can trash the government and create a new one, which is what they were doing in the Declaration of Independence, declaring independence. But they could do that because people create the government and therefore the government gets its power from the people. Uh, this was different than, say, like divine right of kings, you know, in Europe in the Middle Ages, kings sort of said, well, God made me king, and if you got a problem with me, you got a problem with God, so take it up with him. You can't do anything about it. But during the Enlightenment, they come up with this idea that, no, people create their governments, which, of course, you know, logically speaking, is pretty straightforward. Like, people existed before governments. People got together and created governments. So there you go. Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> Another weird thing that they say you need to know on the test that most people would have no idea about is the Constitution of Massachusetts from 1780, which puts it after the American Revolution, but before the US Constitution. And that's important because it starts to develop some of the ideas that become part of the US Constitution. Uh, between the American Revolution and the US Constitution, there was a different Constitution. Anyone remember what that was? the Articles of Confederation. So this is after the American Revolution, but before we get to the US Constitution, the Constitution of Massachusetts. Why is that important? Well, because the Constitution of Massachusetts has three fairly equal branches of government, just like our modern US Constitution. So it establishes this concept of separation of powers in the United States. The governor of Massachusetts not only was fairly powerful, but he had veto power, just like the US president, okay? So it was establishing some of the concepts and principles that would become part of the US uh, Constitution. But it wasn't exactly the same. For example, your ability to vote was based on your land ownership. So it was establishing things, but not exactly what we'd end up with the US Constitution. But the Constitution of Massachusetts did have three branches of government and separation of powers, meaning each branch had different powers and had some ability to check the other branches. For example, the governor being able to veto legislation from the legislative branch. <clears throat> Articles of Confederation, the first US Constitution it was pretty different. There was no executive, there was no president, there was no federal court system either. So they only had one branch of government, the legislative, the Congress. 
Each state would send one representative. They got one vote in this Congress. So it was a confederation. Con means together. Federation is a group coming together like the Federation of Planets in Star Trek. If you're familiar with that, you guys are all nerds. So some of you might be Star Wars fans instead of Star Trek fans. But the Federation of Planets. What is a federation? It's not a word we use too much, but it is a group that's coming together for a common purpose, but each member of that group retains its individual identity and authority. So if you know about the Federation of Planets, each planet is still its own thing. It still has its own culture. It still has its own rules. They don't really interfere. They just partner together for things like exploring the universe. So the Articles of Confederation was that. The states came together for purposes of like common defense, but each state was still an independent state. Now, in most of the world, when you talk about a state, what you're talking about is a country. The United States is kind of different in that, but the reason they're called states in the United States is because originally they were countries. These 13 colonies separated from England and formed their own states, and effectively they were all their own country but then they came together and formed the confederation of states. But let's say you are the state of Georgia. <clears throat> You're basically your own country. You're thinking about partnering with these other states for say common defense. How much of your own identity and power do you want to give up to this federation? Probably not very much. Same thing here. They did not want to give up much power to the federation. So, they formed this sort of weak system where there was no executive, no courts or anything like that, just a Congress. But again, if you're a small state, let's say you're Rhode Island, and there's some bigger states like Virginia and stuff like that, when you're joining this federation, you're an independent state, you're an independent country, you wanna be treated equally. So when they formed the Congress in the Articles of Confederation, they made it so that every state was equal. Some are bigger, some are smaller, but they're all independent countries. They all have equal vote. <clears throat> now, this was very weak. One of the big problems, and this is something they like to ask about on the test, so you should definitely know, is the Articles of Confederation did not give Congress the ability to tax the states. So how do they fund anything? Well, they could ask for donations. Now, how well do you think that went? It did not go well, okay? In fact, there was an event called Shays' Rebellion. After the American Revolution, different states had a lot of debt. Sh um, um, Massachusetts was trying to raise taxes to pay for their debt. Farmers couldn't pay for their taxes, so the government started taking away their farms, and farmers revolted. Well, as this rebellion's going, the state of Massachusetts asked for help from the Federation, the Confederation, and the Congress says, okay, we agree, you need help, so we're gonna approve an army to go and fight for you. In order to fund an army though, you need money. So they ask for donations. All the other states are like, what? Like you asked Georgia, would you give us money so we can fight a war in Massachusetts? Georgia's like, no, no I think I'll just keep my money. Um, so Congress couldn't send an army because they couldn't fund the army. Well, once, uh, eventually Massachusetts did defeat Shays' Rebellion, but once that was over, all the states knew, basically, if you're in trouble, you're on your own because the Congress can't do anything. Even if they want to do something, they can't because they have no money. So the whole system fell apart. No point in joining a federation for the common defense if the federation can't defend you, okay? So this inability to tax destroyed the system. But originally, again, all the states were independent countries and they didn't want to give up any power to the national government. During this time, another document, as I mentioned, the Northwest Ordinances. Uh, there's actually a few, sometimes it's called the Northwest Ordinance of 1780, but the, there was a couple additions. It created the Northwest Territory, basically Ohio. Today, when we think of the Northwest, we think of like Oregon, Washington, but in the 13 colonies, Ohio is Northwest. Here's what you need to know about the Northwest Ordinances. It created a process for adding states to the union. There were originally 13 states, now we have 50. So we had to add some, how did we do that? Northwest Ordinance created a process for that. 
Also, the Northwest Ordinances banned slavery in the new territory. Okay. Slavery was a contentious, very controversial, highly debated issue from the very beginning of America. And when they created the Northwest Ordinance in 1780, they banned slavery in the new territories. It also recognized that Native Americans had claims to land. The Northwest Ordinance didn't do much to really help the Native Americans, but it at least said, yeah, there's these people there, they live there, and they probably have some rights to land there. Um, we'll just go ahead and violate all those rights later. But um, you probably know a little bit of that history, like here's your reservation. Oh, wait, we decided we want that land, we're gonna take that, you push you a little farther. But it did recognize that they had some rights. <clears throat> so created a process for adding states and banned slavery. Those are the two things they really like to ask about on the test though. And if you have any questions as we go through this, I'll go through a lot kind of qu quickly and stuff, but ask. The Federalist Papers. They are almost certainly gonna ask questions about the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were written by the Federalists, specifically three people. Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. How many of you have seen the musical Hamilton? <laughs> okay, so you know, which one of those wrote most of them? Hamilton, yeah. But uh, the three of them wrote them. Hamilton, Madison, and Jay. Sometimes they'll ask questions again about who wrote things. Who wrote the Declaration of Independence? Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Who wrote the Federalist Papers? Hamilton and Madison and Jay, although Hamilton wrote most of them. Who wrote the Constitution? John Locke. James Madison. James Madison, yeah. John Locke wrote a book, but he was British. And, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the Federalists, they wanted a stronger national government that would have distinct powers from the states. So remember the Articles of Confederation failed because of Shays' Rebellion and the inability to tax. So the Federalists come along and say, okay, we need to come up with a stronger national government. There was a group called the Anti-Federalist. They did not want a stronger national government. Everybody knew the Articles of Confederation failed, but the Anti-Federalists were like, we can fix that, we can tweak that, we'll figure something out. But the Federalists wanted a stronger national government. <clears throat> They're called the Federalists because federalism is a system of government where you have power divided at two levels. In our case, the national and the state. Each one has distinct separate powers. So that's what they wanted. They wanted a stronger national government that had distinct powers. They did not want all the power in the national government. The states would still have some powers. They would just have different powers. Uh, these documents were basically a series of newspaper articles written to convince the people of New York, where they lived, that they should support the ratification of the Constitution, because after the Constitution was written, the states had to approve it and join this new system. So the point of these papers was to convince people that they should support the Constitution. So it's going to go through and argue why the Constitution is good, and it's going to refute any arguments against the Constitution. So the Anti-Federalists were also writing their own papers. Anyone remember from like high school government who wrote the Anti-Federalist papers? Uh, we don't actually know the name of the person, but we know the name they used, the pen name, and it was Brutus. We'll get to that later. Okay, so that's the Federalist papers. <clears throat> I'm gonna go through a few of the Federalist papers that they like to ask about and just give you the main arguments, okay? So you can kind of see the purpose of the Federalist Papers and how they work. Federalist Paper number 10. <clears throat> it's all about the issue of factions. Factions are groups that have some interest of their own that does not align with everyone else's interest. So there are all sorts of factions, okay? Citrus growers in Florida are a faction they have certain desires. For example, they want to make more money on citrus. So they lobby the government to create taxes on citrus or imported orange juice. 
Okay, Cuban Americans in South Florida have certain interests. So they lobby the government. So for example, we treat Cuba differently than any other communist country in all sorts of policies because Cuban Americans lobby for certain things. Okay, here in Lakeland, you might have uh, people driving lifted diesel trucks as a faction and they want things like, they want off-road diesel to be legal and they want lower taxes on diesel fuel and stuff like that. And then you might have hipsters down in Dixieland who want like, you know, bigger subsidies on electric bicycles and, you know, things, solar panels and stuff. So they're all different groups arguing for different issues. And these are factions. Federalist 10 is all about how do we keep the nation united when we have all these different groups that want different things. So, Federalist 10 argues that a larger government, a larger nation is actually gonna be better at handling factions than a small state. The bigger the government is, the better they're gonna handle factions. And the reason for that is bigger nations are gonna have more factions and with more factions competing for power, no individual faction can gain too much power and take over. So the whole argument is that a bigger government is going to be more stable because yes, it's gonna have lots of people competing for power, but nobody's gonna be able to amass enough power to take over. So that is Federalist Paper 10. It's all about factions and how a larger government is gonna be better able to handle those factions. <clears throat> Federalist Paper 39. Federalist Paper 39 deals with the question, is the Constitution both Republican and Federal or Federalist? Well, what do we mean by this? Republican. Okay, this goes back to Greek city-states, which were democracies, versus, say, the Romans, which had a large republic. Okay, in a republic, people don't vote on every single thing. In a, in a technical democracy, in a strict democracy, every citizen votes on every issue. But in a republic, you vote on representatives who then get elected for two years or four years or six years or whatever, and they make decisions during that time period. So we have a republican system of government, okay? Now in common, everyday use, sometimes we talk about America as a democracy, that's perfectly fine because we vote, but technically speaking, America is a republic. So. Is the Constitution both Republican and federal is the question. And they argue, yes, it is. It is Republican because we get to vote for our representatives. But it's also federal. Federal means that power is divided at two levels, the national and the state level. So if all we're doing is, as members of states, voting on people to go to the national government, that's Republican, but how do we keep the power at the state level? Federalist 39 argues that the Senate does that because the Senate actually wasn't directly elected by the people. Anyone know how senators were first chosen? Originally, the state legislature got to pick the senators from that state. So the people up in Tallahassee would pick our senators from Florida. And since the government of Florida, the legislature was picking the senators, then the senators were representing the state not really the people of the state. And in that sense, the uh, state power was still being protected. So one of the issues the Anti-Federalists said was that if the national government is so powerful, they're gonna take over and they're gonna make the states not matter anymore and stuff like that. And Federalist 39 says, no, the Senate's gonna make sure that never happens because the senators are chosen by state leaders. So they're never gonna let the national government take over and destroy the state's powers. So. The Senate kept it federal, and the fact that we were voting for House of Representatives and President and all that sort of stuff keeps it Republican. <clears throat> One of the criticisms they address, because again, they're not only arguing for their point of view, they're addressing the criticisms. Uh, one of the criticisms that the Anti-Federalists had is that the government in New York, eventually Washington, D.C., is too far away. If, if you're someone in Georgia and you're sending your representative to New York, you know, they're not gonna represent you anymore. Politicians are gonna be too separated from the people. So they have to respond to this criticism. And what they say is that the House is elected by the people, just like in every state legislature. 
So they actually go through and they argue. Every single state has a House of Representatives that elects the people, or elects the representatives. So if you're gonna say that these people are too separated, it's you know just like saying all the states don't work, and clearly the states believe they're working. Um, and the Senate is indirectly elected because we elect the uh, state legislatures who elect the senators. So even the senators, even though they're really representing the state leaders, they're representing state leaders who are elected by the people, so they're still representing the people. So this is gonna keep the House and the Senate still kind of tied to the people. And especially with the House of Representatives because they're elected every two years, they can't really afford to get too distant because they are constantly running for election. That's the next part. The length of elected terms is in line with state legislatures and governors. The House is elected for two years, just like in all the states. So again, if you're gonna say that representatives are gonna become too distant because you know they're only elected every two years, then you'd have to say that every single state is failing. The Senate, they do get elected for six years, but that's only one year longer than the Senate of Maryland. It was actually longer than any other state, uh, but they point out that Maryland, they elect them for five years. We're only going to six years. It's not that big of a difference. It's still gonna keep people connected. And the president is elected for four years, which again is longer than all the states, but they point out that unlike most of the states, the US president can be impeached. So yes, we're electing the president for a longer term, but if the president gets too crazy, we can always impeach the president. So they go through and they address to point out that it's still a Republican system. These people are all still going to represent the people because they're being elected directly or indirectly by the people. They're still accountable to the people. They still need to be reelected. If they get too crazy, they can be impeached, all these sorts of things. They go through and say that even judges in the judicial branch are still representing the people. But you don't elect judges, you might say. I can't do anything about judges. But they would say you elected the president and you elected the senators. The president nominated the judges and the senators approved the judges. So people you elected to represent you are selecting the judges, so judges still represent you in some way. So again, the House, the Senate, the President, and judges are all chosen either directly or indirectly by the people. So it's gonna keep the government at the national level still closely tied to the people. Criticism, another one. The government is going to concentrate too much power in one place. Again, remember, a huge issue in the writing of the Constitution is this thing where the states don't want to give up much power because they're all independent countries. They don't want to give up power. So they're worried that this new national government is going to take up too much power. So responses. The House is accountable to the people. The Senate is accountable to the states. So the government can't take power from the people and the government can't take, take power from the states. These two things are going to keep the national government from getting too powerful. The House makes the Constitution a national Republican government because we're electing representatives, and the Senate makes it a Federalist system because the Senate, again, represents the states, and the Senate's not gonna let the national government take the power of the states away. So there you go. <clears throat> so they say that the Constitution has a good balance between national power and state power. It fixes the issue of the Articles of Confederation, which is that the national government had no power, it fixes that, but it doesn't give too much power to the national government. It still retains state identity and state power. Okay, side note, the 17th Amendment changed all this. Uh, since the 17th Amendment, now senators are elected by the people, so we elect senators. It's no longer the state legislature picking that, uh, which of course, gets rid of one of the whole arguments of the Federalist Papers, which was that the Senate always would represent the states. Now it represents the people just like the House does. Okay, Federalist 51. This is written to explain separation of powers and checks and balances, another key aspect of the Constitution. Montesquieu, if you don't remember him from high school, you should definitely know the name Montesquieu. You should know John Locke. John Locke wrote about natural rights, life, liberty, and property. 
And Montesquieu is a French philosopher, also an Enlightenment philosopher, who wrote about separation of powers. So Montesquieu, an important person to know about. According to Montesquieu, the government should separate power into three branches. A legislative branch that makes the laws, an executive branch. Of course, he thought the executive would be a king, not a president, but still an executive branch that would enforce the laws and a judicial branch that would interpret laws. That sounds a lot like our system, okay? Because it is. That system became part of the Massachusetts Constitution and then the US Constitution. Three branches of basically equal powers, but divided powers. They have distinct separate powers. Federalist 51 says that each branch is largely independent. We have that separation of powers. Members of each branch really don't have a lot of power over the others. Um, the exception, of course, is courts. The judges are appointed by the president and the Senate. The president nominates them, the Senate approves them. But once they're appointed to the court, then they're independent because they have lifetime tenure, which means they can't be fired unless they're impeached. So there is a slight check there, but it's not likely. It hasn't happened very many times. Okay, <clears throat> so once they're appointed, they're largely independent. They don't have to go back and you know, get approval every so many years or anything like that. And of course, Montesquieu argues and the Federalist Papers argue that these three branches are all gonna wanna be more powerful. Everybody wants to be more powerful, so they're gonna wanna be more powerful, but they're gonna be fighting with each other for power and keeping each other in balance. So no, no one branch is gonna become too powerful because the other branches are gonna wanna stop that so they can stay powerful. And there's a famous quote there, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. So the founders believed that people basically want to abuse their power if they can. So we have to have these systems to restrain them and keep them from becoming too powerful. And if you think, nah, we can trust them, well then why do we need government at all if we can trust people? So there's a challenge. How do we make a government strong enough to control people because we need laws, but we also want to keep the government accountable and not abusive to the people. So they argue we have representative government, so it's accountable to the people. People can always elect different people, kick people out and stuff like that. And then even within the government, we have checks and balances so that they can't get too powerful. They even go into military power and say even the military is divided. Again, separation of powers, not just in the three branches, but within the military. What, What's going to stop the military from becoming too powerful? Well, the commander in chief is the president. The president is in charge of the military, but the president is not a member of the military. So the president is outside the military. And what's to stop the president and the military from getting together and deciding to take over? Well, Congress provides the funding for the military. So if the president and the military get together and decide they're going to take over, Congress can be like, guess what? We just cut your budget. <laughs> Put fuel in your tanks now you know, or something like that, okay? So we've got this separation of powers. <clears throat> treaties and ambassadors, the president makes treaties and nominates ambassadors, but the Senate has to approve them. So over and over again, we have this separation of powers to keep any one group from getting too powerful. Now, within all that, they still recognize that the legislative branch is the most powerful. The legislative branch makes the laws. That's a lot of power. When you have the power to make laws, that's a lot of power. And they have the power of the budget, so they control all the money. So that's a lot of power. So they say, why wouldn't that be too much power? Well, because we divided that even further. So the legislative branch is itself divided into the House and the Senate, and each one of those is gonna compete to become more powerful. So they're gonna be fighting each other. Okay. So that is the Federalist Papers, again, arguing for the Constitution. There was the, uh, the Anti-Federalist Papers written by Brutus. We don't really know who Brutus was, but we know why the person chose the name Brutus. Brutus was a friend of Caesar during the Roman Republic, but then Caesar went from just being a nice little old senator to being a dictator, emperor, declared himself emperor of the Romans. And then Brutus, who was a friend of his though, led a group of people to 
kill and assassinate Caesar. And if you've heard the expression, a tu Brutus, it's because, you know, Caesar supposedly, as he was dying, looked and saw, even you, Brutus, and you, my own friend, killing me. But the idea was that Brutus loved the Republic so much that he would even kill his friend if his friend was endangering the Republic. So what the Anti-Federalists anti -federalists were saying was, we love this Republic so much, we're going to fight and make sure that the, anti -feder or the, the Federalists don't destroy our Republic by making this strong national government like Caesar. They were worried that the national government was going to become this sort of emperor, this dictator. So that was why they chose the name Brutus. Then, eventually though, the US Constitution does get ratified. It was written in 1787, ratified or approved in 1788, and effective in 1789. You don't need to know the years, but just to kind of give you a framework for time. You know, we had the revolution in 1776. We had Massachusetts Constitution in 1780, and the, um, the Northwest Ordinance in 1780. A few years later, we get to the US Constitution. The US Constitution begins with the phrase, we the people. This phrase represents popular sovereignty. It's another thing they might ask you about. They like asking about popular sovereignty and they like asking about the preamble to the US Constitution, the very beginning. So we the people, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. So we as people are creating the government. The government is getting its power from the people popular sovereignty. And of course, that's enlightenment philosophy again, that governments get its power from the people. And of course, in the Constitution, we have Montesquieu and his idea of separation of powers and three branches. Um, this is something that we would discuss in one of the other competencies, but I'll mention it now anyway. Uh, I mentioned how the legislative branch was the most powerful, although it was divided. Article one of the Constitution, First article is about the legislative branch. Article two is about the executive branch. And article three is about the judicial branch. And the reason it's in that order is they started with what they thought was the most powerful, important branch, the legislative. Then they went to the second most powerful and important, the executive. And then the third being the judicial branch. Sometimes on the test, they do like to ask questions like, article two of the US Constitution is about what? It's about the executive branch. Article three is about the judi judicial branch. Okay, but anyway, the preamble, we the people of the United States, there you go, popular sovereignty. <clears throat> they also say you need to know about the various clauses of the Constitution. One of them is the supremacy clause. To be supreme is to be in control. So who's in control? of this country. Well, the Constitution is the chief law of the land, okay? So the Constitution is in control and the national government is over the state governments. So the Supremacy Clause has two parts. First, if there's a conflict between a state law and a national law, the national law wins. States cannot have power over the national government. The national government has to be more powerful than the states, at least when there's a conflict like that. Uh, this goes to a Supreme Court case. One of the ones you need to know is McCulloch v. Maryland. In this case, the national government created the national bank. The state of Maryland tried to tax the national bank. And the Supreme Court ruled that the supremacy clause means that the state cannot tax the national government because if you have the power to tax somebody, you have to have authority over them and states cannot have authority over the national government. Also, the second part of the Supremacy Clause is if a law of a state or the national government conflict with the Constitution, the Constitution wins. That's where we get this whole idea of laws being invalidated by the Supreme Court, overturned, overruled, because they violate the Constitution. <clears throat> Patrick, do you remember what Supreme Court case established the principle of judicial review that the courts can rule a case or a law unconstitutional? He was at our Supreme Court case presentation, but we went over 26 cases. So anyone remember? 
from like high school. Marbury v. Madison. So Marbury v. Madison was the first Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court ruled that a law was unconstitutional. There's also something called the full faith and credit clause. It says that in general, court rulings and contracts from one state would be honored in other states. So if we have a contract and you know, Patrick and I go into business together and we form a contract and all sorts of stuff. If we move to another state, the contract's still valid, okay? Basically, pretty straightforward and simple. If you get married in one state and you move to another state, you don't have to get married over again. The marriage is still valid. It's a, a contract, a legal document. This is in general. For example, driver's licenses are honored throughout the country, but fishing licenses aren't. So it's not always clear what will be honored. Um, if you know, several years ago, there was this big debate about with gay marriage and that issue because some states were allowing gay marriage, some weren't. And the question was, if you have a marriage in one state but move to a state that doesn't have gay marriage, are you still married? Um, and then eventually the Supreme Court got involved in that. But so it's not always 100% clear, but as a general principle, court rulings, legal documents, contracts from one state are honored throughout the country. That's the full faith and credit clause. There's also something called the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause says that Congress has the power to create rules, laws, for any trade that crosses state lines, commerce being trade, or any trade that goes into or out of the country crossing national lines. If something happens purely within one state, it's supposed to be that state's ability, power to regulate that, not Congress. But once it starts crossing state lines, that becomes an issue for the national government. <clears throat> so the Commerce Clause, Congress has the ability to regulate trade crossing state or national lines. Due Process Clause. This is found twice in the Constitution, in the 5th and the 14th Amendments. It says that government cannot take away your rights without giving you whatever the process is outlined in law. So for example, if you own a house and an acre of land and the government says, we want this land to build a highway, well, there's a process that they have to go through to take that land. They have to give you a fair price. If you don't think the amount of money they're offering you is enough, you can go to court and argue why it should be more. There's a process. If the school decides this is a state, a public institution, so this university is a government, are part of the government. If the school decides, you know what, we don't like you anymore, we wanna kick you out of school. Well, you have a student code of conduct and all sorts of rules. There's a process they have to go through to kick you out. Uh, it depends on the situation, but whatever it is that's outlined in law, that's the process that they have to follow. So government cannot take away your rights without following the process. This was originally in the Fifth Amendment but it was added again in the 14th Amendment because the 14th Amendment is one of three amendments in the Reconstruction Amendments after the Civil War, which extend all these rights to black Americans as well, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Uh, so the Due Process Clause in the 14th Amendment is also extended to states, which is why states can also not take away your rights. The Due Process Clause. There is the Equal Protection Clause that is also in the 14th Amendment. The Equal Protection Clause says exactly what it sounds like, that all people have equal protection under the law. Again, that is part of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the Reconstruction Amendments, which are adding black Americans to all the protections that we have under the Constitution. So we wanted to make sure that all people are protected by constitutional rights so that's the Equal Protection Clause. All people are entitled to equal protection under the law. There's also the Necessary and Proper Clause. That's another one that's pretty straightforward. The Constitution gives certain powers to Congress. These are called enumerated powers. They're like numbered or listed in the Constitution. The Constitution specifically money, for example, okay? 
But Congress can also do whatever is necessary and proper to carrying out those enumerated powers. So, for example, the Constitution says Congress can coin money, print money, but it does not say that Congress has the ability to throw you in jail for counterfeiting. But isn't it reasonable that if they can print money, they should be able to make sure you're not printing fake money? Seems like in order to actually control the money supply, that's a necessary and proper thing for them to do. Okay, so necessary and proper clause says they can do whatever is necessary and proper to carry out those spe specific specified enumerated powers. Sometimes this is also known as the elastic clause because it allows Congress to stretch their powers. The Constitution says we can do this, so we can stretch it to also include this other thing. <clears throat> Some other examples besides counterfeiting money and stuff like that, the military draft. The Constitution does not say Congress can make a draft and force you in the military, but it does say they can declare war and they can raise a military. So the Supreme Court has said, well, then it makes sense that they can force you to join the military in order to fight that war. You can agree or disagree with that, but that's what the Supreme Court said. Okay, the National Bank is also not in the Constitution. That was part of that whole McCulloch v. Maryland case. Uh, but the Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution does give Congress some ability, some power to regulate the economy. And it seems reasonable that if they think they need to create a national bank as part of that process, then okay, they can do that. So the elastic clause has been used a lot of times to expand the power of Congress over the years. And finally, you should know about two clauses of the First Amendment. The First Amendment has five rights. Anyone know what those five rights are? Yeah? I can give you like two of them. Okay. Uh, free speech and uh, right to protest peaceably. Okay. So that's actually second. <laughs> so free speech, right of petition, which kind of protest, but protest also ties into another one you said peacefully, which is assembly. Okay. Religion. And press. Okay. Well, within those five rights, there are two specific clauses that both deal with freedom of religion. One is the free exercise clause which says that you can freely practice whatever religion you want. And also there's the establishment clause that says Congress cannot establish a national religion. So freedom of religion has two parts. One, you are free to practice whatever religion you want. And two, government cannot force you to practice any religion. So free exercise, you can practice whatever religion you want establishment, the government cannot establish a national religion. Okay. <clears throat> Here's another weird thing that almost nobody would know if you went around and asked on the streets, but they might hint, hint, ask about this on the test. In 1802, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter. What was the to topic of that letter? Like, like, who would know that? But it's up there, yeah. I think you might be thinking of Hamilton again. Oh, shoot, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Reynolds pamphlet. Um, this is about religious freedom. 1802, Thomas Jefferson was elected president. Now, it was well known at the time that Thomas Jefferson was not a fan of biblical Christianity um, in the sense of like he didn't really believe the Bible and stuff like that. Um, but he was an advocate of religious freedom. The Baptist Church in Danbury, Connecticut, when he was elected, wrote him a letter and said, hey, we really like you, we're glad you're elected president, all sorts of stuff, but we also wanna know, what do you think about religious freedom now that you're president? And he wrote back and said, basically, I agree with you. He wrote the famous phrase, separation of church and state, probably all heard of that. Well, separation of church and state, he didn't actually create that phrase. A guy named Roger Williams, who was the first Baptist in America, created that phrase. And Thomas Jefferson was quoting to the Baptist Church in Danbury, Connecticut, the first Baptist in America, Roger Williams, and basically saying, I agree with you, which is that we all have religious freedom. So that was the topic of the 1802 letter 
religious freedom. Again, it's one of those things that if you went around on the street and asked 100 people, what was this letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote in 1802 to the Danbury Baptist Church, Danbury, Connecticut, like, I don't think anybody would know, okay? But they like to ask about it on the test. So, 1802, Thomas Jefferson, religious freedom or religious liberty. They might phrase it either way, religious freedom or religious liberty, but that's the idea. So you should know that. <clears throat> now, that is the big stuff from the founding documents that you need to know. So the state does provide a short sample test. So I thought we'd go through some of the sample questions that you might now know the answer to. So here's the first one. What is the principal function of a written constitution? A, resolving disagreements between competing parties. B, confirming resistance to civil disobedience. C, declaring the independence of a state. Or D, outlining the structure and powers of a government. D, a constitution constitutes or creates a government and creates the system of structure and powers. So for example, our constitution outlines the structure, three different branches, it outlines the powers of each branch, what each one can do. The president is the commander in chief of the military, the Congress controls the budget, all those sorts of things. So the constitution sets up the structure and powers of government. <clears throat> Um, as, sometimes if I have students, for some reason, read some part of the Constitution, I always explain the Constitution's really boring, but it was meant to be boring. It's, it's a Constitution. It's just outlining the structure and powers of government. That shouldn't be too exciting. It's basically our national contract. Contracts are not exciting documents to read. Which of the following objectives best describes the purpose of a system of checks and balances as defined in the US Constitution? A, establishing accountability for the government when levying taxes. B, maintaining a healthy economy and establishing trade with other, other governments. C, keeping any one of the three branches of government from becoming too powerful. Or D, assuring that the government spends only as much money as it takes in. C, yeah, keeping each of the branches from becoming too powerful and taking over. So they have the separation of powers, checks and balances. There you go. <clears throat> Which form of government is based on popular sovereignty? A, communism, B, dictatorship, C, monarchy, or D, republic? D, <laughs> D republic, yeah. The people are in control of the government. So, uh, republic. We have a republic. 11, use the provided preamble to the United States Constitution to answer the question. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Which of the following statements best describes the preamble of the US Constitution? A. Governments are accountable to the citizens over whom they rule. B, states will ensure that all citizens are granted certain freedoms. C, people allow representatives to speak on behalf of all citizens. Or D, courts will elect officials to represent the people and ensure liberty. And the key there is that we, the people, form the government. So the governments are accountable to the people. The people form the government, the government keeps them accountable. So a little tricky there. Uh, one of the things they like to do on the test is this sort of thing where they give you some quote and then they ask you something about the quote. Um, in the United States, how are conflicts between state laws and federal laws generally resolved? A, the conflict must be resolved by the U.S. Attorney General. B, the conflict must be resolved by a national referendum. C, the conflict must be resolved using the Supremacy Clause. Or D, the conflict must be resolved using the Tenth Amendment. C, C Supremacy Clause, yeah. <clears throat> and if there is a conflict between state law and federal law, the Supremacy Clause says what? Federal law takes priority. 
yeah, the national law, the federal law wins. And if there's a conflict between a law and a constitution, the constitution wins. The constitution is the supreme law of the land or chief law of the land. You should know that phrase. They like to ask something like that. What, what is the supreme law of the land or what is the chief law of the land? It's the constitution. The constitution always wins. Everything our government does is evaluated by the constitution. The constitution always wins. Use the passage below, which was included in the Declaration of Sentiments adopted at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 to answer the question that follows. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Which of the following documents influence the aims and strategies of the authors of the Declaration of Sentiments? A, the Northwest Ordinance. B, Articles of Confederation, C, U.S. Constitution, D, Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence? Yeah, do you know why? Because Thomas Jefferson said that. Yeah, this phrase, if you just take out and women, you take out those two words, that's an exact quote from the Declaration of Independence. So one Put of the things, out. no, this was written later. Oh, okay. So one of the things they like to do on this test, according, the state has a document. It's like a little four page document that says, the things you need to know for the test. It's not very detailed, like it has 26 Supreme Court cases and it just lists the cases. It doesn't tell you anything about them, but it tells you like the documents. This document, the Declaration of Sentiments is not on the list. So according to the state, you do not need to know anything about the Declaration of Sentiments for this test. But they put this on here because according to the state, this isn't really a question about the Declaration of Sentiments, it's a question about the Declaration of Independence. So sometimes they like to put things on there that aren't supposed to be on the test, but they're really testing, do you recognize something else about it? And in this case, uh, the Declaration of Independence written in 1776 said that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, the Declaration of Sentiments uh, at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 was a women's rights convention and women and men, because there's actually, it was a women's rights convention, but there were men and women there, got together and they drafted this document for women's rights and they took the words of Thomas Jefferson and they said that all men and women are created equal. So they were just expanding on the idea of the Declaration of Independence. So if you do happen to see a question on the test and you're like, what the heck is this? It might be asking about something completely different and just seeing if you recognize it. <clears throat> Which political philosopher's ideas are best represented in the Declaration of Independence? Thomas Hobbes, Ethan Allen, John Locke, or James Madison? John Locke. John Locke. Yeah, John Locke. Okay, John Locke wrote about natural rights and the ability of people to create or change their governments. So that is the Declaration of Independence. Who was the guy who wrote about separation of powers? Montesquieu. Montesquieu, yeah, yeah. In the Mayflower Compact, Plymouth settlers pledged to unite into a civil body politic and agreed to make and abide by laws that ensured the general good of the colony. What founding document did this set a precedent for? A, the Declaration of Independence, B, Constitution, C, Magna Carta, or D, Bill of Rights? Constitution. <laughs> yeah, even though you don't sound very confident of that. So in the Mayflower Compact, what were the people doing? 
Well, the pilgrims arrived in this new land and there was no government. I don't know if you know the story, but they were trying to go somewhere else and they landed in the wrong place. They were trying to go to an established colony and they landed in the middle of nowhere. And when they got there, they had to decide, what are we gonna do? There's nothing here, there's no government. And they decided to form a government before they got off the ship. And so they all got together and they formed this agreement. So this is also popular sovereignty. The people could have done anything and they formed a government but they formed a government to serve the needs of all the people, which is what the constitution is supposed to be. We, the people, in order to do a bunch of things, form this government. So the Mayflower Compact is an early example of people forming a constitution for the benefit of the group. <clears throat> which person is considered to be the principal author of the US Constitution? Thomas Jefferson, Richard Henry Lee, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison. James Madison, yeah. Jefferson wrote the uh, Declaration of Independence. Anyone remember who wrote Common Sense? Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine, yeah. Uh, that could also be on there. Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense, which was January of 1776, and it kind of argued for independence, and it built common public support for declaring independence. But James Madison is the primary author of the Declaration, I mean, I'm sorry, of the Constitution. <laughs> Government by the people and the separation of powers are the main principles of which founding document? Bill of Rights, U.S. Constitution, Mayflower Compact, Northwest Ordinance. I don't know if you're raising your hand there. No. Oh, okay. Which document says the government gets its power from the people and the government should have separation of powers? Constitution. Uh, the first part, government by the people, could be the Declaration of Independence or something like that. Um, but, you know, that's not a choice here, so it doesn't even matter. Uh, but government by the people and separation of powers is the Constitution. Use the excerpt below from the 13th Amendment to answer the question that follows. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the parties shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Which of the following contains a clause that may have served as an inspiration for the above language? A, Declaration of Independence, B, Articles of Confederation, C, Northwest Ordinances, or D, Federalist Papers? Northwest Ordinances, because the Northwest Ordinances did two things. What were those two things? It allowed it the entry of new states into, yeah. the, into the government, and mm -hmm. it prevented the new state to be in a, to do slavery. Exactly. It created a process for adding new states to the Union, and it said those new states in the Northwest Territory would be free, would have no slavery. So the fact that it banned slavery, the wording, even though you don't know the exact wording, it has to do with slavery. So this 13th Amendment ending slavery comes from that document. <clears throat> At the Constitutional Convention, there was a major debate between large states and small states about representation in the new Congress. This debate was resolved by the Great Compromise. What was the result of this compromise? The number of citizens in a state would determine how many seats the state had in Congress, but slaves and other non-citizens would not be counted for this purpose. Congress would have two houses, one in which state representation was based on population, and one in which all states had equal representat representation. The number of seats each state would have in both houses of Congress would be based on the state's population, and Congress would be made up of two houses in which all states had an equal number of representatives in each house. This one's a little trickier. We didn't quite exactly talk about this, but maybe you can figure it out by thinking about what we did talk about. Yeah? B. B, Congress would have two houses, one in which state representation was based on population and one equal representation. Yes, because big states wanted 
Congress to be based on population, so big states would have more power. Small states are like, I'm still a state, I'm a small state, but I'm still a state, why would I give up and join this new constitution if I'm gonna be weaker? And so the compromise was that small states would get the Senate so that they get equal representation. Big states would get the House of Representatives so big states have more power. And the idea again sort of, I don't want you to confuse the ideas, but sort of like checks and balances. Um, in this sense, the big states couldn't run over the small states because the House, the big states could all get together and do whatever they want, but they need the Senate as well. So they can't just do whatever they want. And the small states can't get together and run over the big states. They can in the Senate, but they can't in the House. So nothing gets through unless the small states and big states both agree to it. So there you go.